The panelists for this session are Drs. Emily Chu and Marco Zarbin. Dr. Chu is the Director of the Division of Epidemiology and Clinical Applications at the National Eye Institute um, here in Maryland, where I am also. Um, this is a part of the National Institute of Health. She is also the Chief of the Clinical Trials Branch in the, in the same division. Uh, Dr. Chu received her medical de degree and her ophthalmology training at the University of Toronto and she completed a fellowship in medical retina at Wilmer Eye Institute at the Johns Hopkins Medical Institute and the University of uh, Nijmegen in the Netherlands. Her research interests include phase one, two clinical trials, epidemiologic studies in age-related macular degeneration, diabetic retinopathy, and other ocular diseases. She has worked extensively in large multi-center trials headed by the staff from her division, including the age-related eye disease study, or ERIT, as well as the ERITS-2 study in which she chairs. Uh, she worked on other clinical trials in collaborations with um, other colleagues within the National Institute of Health. Dr. Zarbin is chair of the Institute of Ophthalmology and Visual Science at Rutgers New Jersey Medical School and chief of ophthalmology at University Hospital in Newark, New Jersey. He's a professor of ophthalmology and neuroscience and is the Alphonse uh, Sintoli Lions Eye Research Chair Dr. Zarbin is co-director of the Ocular Cell Transplantation Laboratory. He graduated also from Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine and completed residence and fellowship training at the Wilmer Eye Institute. Dr. Zarbin has published on age-related macular degeneration, stem cell therapy for degenerative retinal disease, and the management of diabetic retinopathy. He is the vice chair of the Foundation Scientific Advisory Board He's Editor-in-Chief of Translational Vision Science and Technology and is a member of the editorial board of several eye journals. Dr. Zarbin is listed among the best doctors by Castle Cannoli. Dr. Chu or Dr. Zarbin, would you like to add anything before we begin with the question? No, thank you, Amy, for having us. We're really delighted to be here. Marco and I are very happy for this opportunity to address any questions that the uh, the audience has, and, and you know, we come with a fair amount of experience, and we've, we've been doing this for a while, and I remember Marco and I <clears throat> started, I'm a little bit older than Marco, but we started, and, and we looked at macular generation, and they were, it's, it's really come a long way in many, many ways, and, and there are a lot of interesting research going on, so with that, we welcome any questions that any of you have, and, and hopefully we will be able to satisfactorily answer your questions and perhaps raise some issues that, that might be of interest to you as well. I, I just want to add that I want you to ask all the hard questions to Dr. Chu because she was one of my <laughs> teachers when I was a medical student. All right. Well, we will now take questions. So as a reminder, you can ask a question by accessing the Q&A feature on the Zoom control bar to type in your question. And I am just looking here. And so actually we'll start with something that's very easy and that is just simply describing um, age-related macular degeneration disease. What is it and um, what are the symptoms and how does it progress? Should I take that one, Marco? Is this an easy one? <laughs> okay. So macular degeneration is defined based upon looking into one's eyes and quite often we put eye drops into dilate the pupils so we can see in the retina which lines the eyeball and the retina is where where a lot of the action happens it's like the film in your camera and that's what your vision comes from so macular degeneration uh, is defined by looking in and seeing a, in the very initial stages are these yellow flecks called drusen and drusen can be found in a, as a normal aging process but when they get to a certain size or much larger they're at risk for developing the later stages of macular degeneration but then you're you're, then you're actually diagnosed with macular degeneration. So at that point, you may not have any symptoms at all. Patients may be perfectly fine seeing 20-20 vision. However, in a group of patients with drusen, 
we've noticed that they may have some dark adaptation problems. What does that mean? That means that when you go from a very bright room to a dark room, like a theater, you may have troubles adjusting to that low level of light. It takes you longer than most patients do. That's one of the symptoms that we see. Uh, and with that, the drusen can actually uh, develop and get larger, and then they, they then actually uh, disappear from our view, but things are happening in the retina, and they cause changes that would then uh, re relate to what we call a late macular generation. There are two forms of that. There's the wet form and the dry form. The wet form is the ones where new blood vessels grow, and for those patients who have the wet form, there is really a fairly, we did a very excellent treatment right now, and that's the injection of drugs into the eye uh, to reduce that risk of the, the, the problems with the new blood vessel causing fluid to build up, new blood vessels causing scarring. Uh, that has been remarkable in how people have been really uh, helped by this particular treatment. But the more common loss is really this dry type, this sort of withering away, very, very slow progressive loss. And, uh, you know, it's a relent loss, relentless type of loss. Our natural history shows that patients may start off at the beginning, about a third of them may actually have central vision loss already, and the other two thirds slowly progress to lose, losing central vision. And we've worked very hard to find treatments for that, but it's been very difficult. Uh, and we're still working very hard to get that treatment, but that dry type is the one that was most difficult. So macular generation is in many forms. Uh, that's, I'm describing what's often seen in sort of people of European descent, Northern European descent. Uh, in Asians, it may be a little different. They have these blood vessels that what we call polypoidal or PCV. These are large vessels that grow underneath the retina and they can cause changes that are slightly different. And it's still a wet form of max generation. So depending on some of the racial aspects, it may be slightly different. But, but for the most part, we talk about the max generation. And of course, it is more common in the whites than it is in African American. And, and the Latinos uh, may be a little bit in between uh, in that sense. So, that in a nutshell is macular generation. Thank you. And um, the next question are, what are some treatments for AMD that are available to patients now? Uh, well, maybe we'll alternate, uh, Emily. Sure. Uh, well, the first level of treatment is actually something that was developed by Dr. Chu and her colleagues at the National Eye Institute, and that's prophylactic therapy. Um, and uh, the, the treatment that Dr. Chu and her colleagues developed is vitamin and mineral replacement therapy. It's a particular combination of uh, zinc and lutein and zeaxanthine um, and copper. Uh, that reduces the risk of moderate visual loss by about uh, 19% during a five-year period of follow-up. Um, so it's not a miracle treatment, but uh, if you have a, a certain level of severity of macular degeneration, which is called intermediate, uh, that treatment has been shown uh, to be very useful. Um, if you don't have any macular degeneration, or if you have very mild macular degeneration, uh, that vitamin and mineral supplement treatment is not useful. So in order to know whether it would benefit you to use it, you need to be seen uh, by a, an ophthalmologist with appropriate uh, expertise to be able to diagnose the stage of macular degeneration. Another very important treatment you could say, which is a lifestyle choice, uh, is the issue of smoking. Uh, of all, there are many, many things that have been studied to, to see, you know, does high cholesterol, does high blood pressure, what, what are the risk factors that influence your risk of getting macular degeneration apart from your own genetic heritage? And the one risk factor that's very robust uh, increases your risk by over a factor of two and a half for getting macular degeneration, wet or dry, and over which you have complete control because you can't change your genes. Uh, is smoking. So if you smoke, you should stop immediately, not just because of the risk of lung cancer, uh, but also because it when you stop smoking, it actually eventually reduces your risk of getting progressive macular degeneration. So those are the first level of treatment that I would say. Uh, the second level uh, Dr. Chu alluded to, which is when you have the wet form of the disease, the abnormal blood vessels growing under the retina, uh, 
in, in, you know, the idea is those vessels are supposed to be helping you see better, providing nourishment to the retina, but the problem is they're very leaky and they leak fluid and blood and cause scarring. And so there's a class of drugs uh, called uh, anti-vascular endothelial growth factor drugs. Uh, and there, there are at least three different kinds. There's a fourth one coming online, um, which reduce the leakiness of the abnormal blood vessels. Uh, the only downside of, that, of those drugs is that um, you have to get uh, injected periodically. It's not a cure. It's an ongoing treatment where you get medicine injected into the eye uh, under anesthesia. And uh, how often you get it injected uh, can vary a bit from patient to patient, but just let's say on average, it's about every eight weeks. Um, and, and that, of course, is a, a challenge for people to come in every eight weeks. Uh, but because of that challenge, uh, there are uh, treatments under development that last longer than every eight weeks. And in addition, there are delivery systems uh, that are making their way through uh, FDA registration trials uh, that allow the drug to be delivered over an extended period of time so that you might only have to come in every six months. Because one thing that the patients and the doctors find very challenging is to come in at regular intervals. If you come in at regular intervals and get your injections, you have about a 35% chance of moderate visual improvement. Uh, on the other hand, if you don't get the regular injections, um, the, you can count on losing vision over a period of five to seven years. Um, so that's one thing, the, the wet form of the disease treatments. Then there's, as Dr. Chu just mentioned, the dry form of the disease, which is also known as geographic atrophy. Some now people refer to it as macular atrophy, which is just the retina wearing out, kind of like the way our skin gets wrinkled as we get older, in our, some of our cases. Um, the, uh, there's a lot, of, a lot of effort to develop treatments there. there are, uh, a, there's a class of drugs known as complement inhibitors, um, which are showing some promise in, 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 er, in relatively early phase clinical trials. Uh, there are two complement inhibitors. I happen to consult for uh, one of the companies that makes one of them, but they both seem to be looking promising. And so uh, if, if, the, if the registration clinical trials, if the phase three clinical trials reproduce the results of the earlier clinical trials, these complement inhibitors look as if they might reduce the rate of, of progression of the geographic atrophy by about 25 to 30%. Uh, over a period of 18 months. So that's, that could be a helpful therapy, uh, but it's, it's in development. Uh, a more advanced kind of therapy that's very experimental, I would say more so than the complement inhibitors, is the idea of getting a cell transplant. And uh, there are some early phase clinical trials involving very small numbers of patients um, where the, the cell transplants appear to be safe for the most part. But I think the evidence that they're working to help people preserve vision or certainly improve vision, I think the evidence there is a little bit uh, more uncertain. And I, and I think a lot more uh, patients are gonna have to be treated before I'll personally be convinced that there's a real uh, benefit to that approach. But in principle, it could be a great approach. Uh, the reason it could be great is because it could be a, a one and done therapy. So you get the cell transplant and then you don't need any more treatment ever for the rest of your life. That would be nice if it were true. Uh, and it also sets up the possibility that um, you could uh, uh, actually recover lost vision depending on the kinds of cells that were injected. And, and my, the last comment I would make about therapy under development is, is gene therapy. Now you might think, oh, he means correcting the genes that caused you to get macular degeneration to begin with. No, I'm, I'm actually not talking about that, although there is some th thought about doing it that way. But the way gene therapy might make its first entry into this particular disease is by providing sustained delivery of, um, of molecules that block the actions of vascular endothelial growth factors. So the idea would be, instead of getting injections of these drugs every eight weeks, you get an injection of the gene that produces these drugs once, and then your body, your eye, produces the drug essentially for the rest of your life. And that 
could be a good thing. It might not be a good thing if anyone wants to talk about that, Dr. Chu, and I can talk about that uh, with you later. But I think that, Emily, do you have any other suggestions for treatments that you'd like to mention? No, I think that's very complete. Um, I may just add one thing, and, and that's something you can do yourself. You know, I, Marco gave a really nice uh, discussion about sort of what you can do yourself, empower you to stop smoking. The lifestyle is really, really important. We recently published a paper looking at the diet, Mediterranean diet. So we're not the only ones, you know, Dr. Seddon's done that before, Dr. Uh, uh, Bernadine uh, Merle's done as well. There's three papers that suggest that taking a Mediterranean diet is really important for your macro generation. Even people who have the intermediate stage that already have the disease, there was a reduction in the progression to the late disease that causes vision loss. And especially, it works especially for people who have the geographic atrophy or the drive one. Uh, it was as much as 30% reduction, you know, uh, or even more. So that really says to us that, you know, you know, you are what you eat. You really need to be careful and, and do that. And some of the data suggested that green leafy vegetables was very important. That was the reason why we put the lutein, zeaxanthin in our, in our vitamin uh, mixture. So I think the, the diet is, and again, we looked at the different components of the Mediterranean diet. It was driven a lot by fish. If you have fish, two servings of fish a week, people who had disease actually was, you know, was, was slowed down from getting the very late disease. And people who had the very early disease, early AMD, were also reduced by about 30% in developing the intermediate. So no matter what level you were at, it seemed to have an effect. It goes along, of course, with perhaps other things. That's only in a, what we call an observational data. It's not a clinical trial, so it's not like you can recommend fully. But, but the data is pretty compelling that we should be doing that for other reasons, you know, for cardiovascular disease, for cancer, uh, and even for cognitive function, it seemed to have an effect. So, so if you can really, you know, be able to change your lifestyle, you know, eating properly, exercising, keeping your weight down, because body mass index or, or your weight and height uh, has an effect looking at some of our studies. Uh, we know that people tend to be a little heavier. And again, this is just for healthy living. So I think that's something that we can all try to strive for. I know it's easier said than done, but, but it's, uh, I think it's an important aspect. Mm -hmm. Can I ask a question, Emily? Um, did it matter? what kind of fish it was did you were you able to track that we didn't really ask what type but traditionally they always talk about the cold water fish like salmon uh, and things and if you look at some of the constituents of the fish it, it, it may be that those things make more sense but even eating a tin of tuna may be very useful so for people who live in food desert areas where there's not a lot of fresh fish you can open up a can of salmon a couple of times a week and, and do that so Great, thank you. Um, there's a couple of questions related to wet AMD. One is um, for wet AMD, is it um, regarding the frequency of injections? Um, how often are there? How often are they? And um, is it possible to get injections less less often? Emily, you want to answer that? Well, that's, that's a very important question. I know that people, both the physicians, as Marco said, physicians and the patient find it difficult to stick to a, a, you know, a very strict schedule. The original studies were done looking at, you know, every four weeks patients were coming in like for a long time, for, for years on end actually. And we do have patients, I actually have a patient who comes in every four weeks, uh, has been doing this for I think close to five or six years, and she's still 2020. So I think the answer is we, d we can't determine without sort of seeing you. The, your, your physician will look and see. Uh, quite often what we're doing now is injecting you and seeing how you do. I mean, it's usually four weeks to bring you back. If it looks good, we eject you and extend it for another week and see if that still looks good. Then we extend it even longer. So that's called treat and extend. So you can actually increase that level and in interval between treatments and it all depends on, on your disease and your condition um, more than anything else. And um, obviously, uh, you know, people who are being treated are at mercies of getting rides, especially if they have good vision. Uh, so it's, it's difficult sometimes to, to adhere to that. But the closer you are adhering to the protocol that your doctor specifies for you, the, the greater the chance it is for really having 
having better visual outcome in the end. And one of the other things is, of course, and monitoring your other eye or eyes that might be at risk because you want to be picking this up as soon as possible. So people who have good vision when they start off with tend to remain pretty good vision. If you have poor vision, you may improve a lot, but you still may not be as good as people who start off with good vision. That's one of the, the issues. So in, in addition to this interval, we want to be monitoring your eyes, making sure that things are, are, are worsening. You know, we, we want to come back in four weeks, but if you had a sudden hemorrhage and you had some changes, we may want to come back sooner. If you're out to eight weeks, but you know, something changed. So I think it's, a, it's always an ongoing dialogue between your doctor and yourself as to what that may be. Uh, there are instances where we can go up to 12 weeks, and we're hoping that, as, as Marco said, some of the drugs might be long, much longer lasting. That would indeed be very helpful to, you, to the patient as well, to the physicians. Uh, who has who have a very busy schedule trying to keep everybody uh, on top of their their schedules? Mark, do you have anything else to add to that? No, I I would just emphasize that there isn't a single study, uh, uh, really not one, that shows that getting fewer injections, uh, more injections, is bad. That there are so that so it's hard to over inject the patient. Uh, that's what I would say, and I think there's a kind of very consistent message through all the literature that the patients that do the best are the ones that get injected literally every month. But that doesn't mean that every month is absolutely necessary. And it turns out you can extend the treatment intervals judiciously. That's what Dr. Chu was talking about, treat and extend. Um, and and um, you, you sort of have to make a choice, you know. Are you going to do everything you can to preserve as much vision as you can, or are you going to do what's convenient? Because I guarantee you it's not convenient for anybody to get the injections as often as most people need them. And when, when we take a look at the clinical trial results for the phase three studies, we're looking at the best results that are achievable. And when we compare the results in clinical practice to the clinical trial results, it's uniformly the case that the results in clinical practice are worse. And it's uniformly the case that they're worse because people are not getting injections as frequently as they would in the clinical trials. So it, it's it, as hard as it is to maintain those visit appointments, uh, it's really important to do that if you wanna get the best visual outcome possible. And of course, doing that doesn't guarantee you'll get a good visual outcome, but but you're guaranteeing yourself the best chance of a good visual outcome. So I would, I would, you know, really try to adhere to the to the treatment interval that's recommended by your doctor. And a um, related question: If cataract surgery is needed, how does the that factor into the regular injections for wet AMD? Well, the first thing to realize is that. Um, having wet AMD doesn't mean that you can't benefit from cataract surgery. Uh, maybe a way to think about it is like a car that, that doesn't start. Uh, if the battery's dead, the car won't start. Uh, if the engine's fused, the car won't start. So more than one thing can be wrong. And with your vision, it's the same thing. Your vision can be down because of the cataract, and it can be down because of the macular degeneration. They can both be contributing. And the, and the, um, the art of medicine is to figure out the relative contributions of each of these factors, and then uh, to determine whether there'll be a material benefit to you as a patient by fixing one of the two of those factors. So for example, if a person has macular degeneration and they're getting injections and their best visual potential, let's just say is 2040, but they have a very significant cataract. And so the result is they can actually only see 2080. Well, that person can benefit from cataract surgery. They might go from being 2080 where you really can't read uh, to 2040, where you can not only read, but you could drive. Um, but they're not going to get to 2020. So that's where the conversation comes in about making the best estimate that we can as doctors about how, mu how much will you benefit 
if you have the cataract removed? And is that amount of benefit worth it to you as a patient? So that's the theoretical framework of making the decision. Now, in terms of the operational issues, um, the way to, there is a possibility that um, your disease, your, your macular degeneration disease will kind of become a little bit more active after cataract surgery because there may be a little bit more intraocular inflammation after cataract surgery. So it's probably a nice thing in principle, if you can manage it, to have your injection a little bit before, but not too long before you have the cataract operation. And maybe to see you back within a month of the cataract operation, even though normally you might be seen eight weeks after your injection, maybe this time you'll be seen four weeks, just to see if there's any additional fluid leakage from the retina, because what you wanna do is you wanna get the injections in such a way that you only have minimal amount of fluid leakage. You'd like to maintain things as, as dehydrated as uniformly as possible. Um, anyway, I'm just speaking for my own practice patterns. And what I've to told you is not some kind of scientific proof that what, I, what I'm recommending is actually what works. So I'd actually be interested to know if, if Dr. Chu has the same guidelines or if they're different, I'd be interested in knowing what they are. No, I actually agree with you 100%, Marco. That's how I do deal with it too. And I think the other interesting point that, that brings out is the fact that I have patients who come in who have max generation and they've been told they shouldn't have their cataract surgery done because it's going to worsen their, their macular degeneration. Uh, and that's something that's I don't think, I believe is true. We've seen it in a number of studies that, that it, it doesn't worsen your macular degeneration. People might progress. Quite often people have macular degeneration in the eye. You can't see it quite well or, or you, you, it, it seems like it might have gotten worse, but that's actually not true. The studies that we've looked at, uh, all the patients after cataract surgery who are deemed to have macular degeneration may actually improve. And in fact, a lot of them do improve. Even though they have a wet form, they still had better visual acuity even before, uh, before they had a cataract surgery. So I think that's a myth that, that you have to be concerned about. And there are, there are physicians who say that uh, on the outside. And I think you should make sure that you, know, you have another opinion. There may, they may be right because the, the macular degeneration is very far gone and, and it's not the cataract that's causing it. But if it is something that, that can be improved, you should do that. And I do the exact the same thing that, that, that Marcos talks about in terms of the treatment, how, operational, how you go about doing this. And we, we discussed this whole issue of going towards the cataract surgery. Just as you say, you know, it may or may not improve it, but we, we usually have a good, a good signal suggesting that it's going to be improved. Uh, and and the, the, the order of things are not quite as important, but you do want to minimize your, your, your damage from any sort of inflammation and being seeing um, more vigilantly, perhaps after cataract surgery is also very helpful to make sure that you are being treated appropriately. Great, thank you. Um, for those who are just joining, I just wanna remind you that you can ask questions um, by accessing the Q&A feature on the Zoom control bar um, where you can type in your question. Um, the next question that we have, um, are people with lighter eye color like hazel blue more prone to developing AMD? So there, there are store, there are studies that suggest that people with lighter, you know, blue eyes may have a higher risk, but it's not confirmed by all studies. For example, the ARID study that I was in chair of, we did not find that at all. Another study I worked on did show that perhaps that might be the case. And the thought is, is it because people who are lighter pigment have more sunlight damage, and just as why that you know why, what if African Americans are have much lower risk of having macular degeneration? Is it because of their pigment? People have thought of that, but in essence, we, we you know it's been one of these these risk factors that hasn't panned out to be perfect um, in alignment with all our studies. So. I think you could have dark brown eyes and still have macular degeneration. Um, so this, I, I don't, we think this is something that we, we have a, a real uh, handle on in terms of it's yes or no, it's really in the gray zone. I don't, Mark, would you have any comments on that? I agree completely. I, the way to think about it is there are uh, causal variables and coincidental variables 
Um, so for example, maybe, I mean, give you an analogy, maybe it's a false analogy, but it, you know, if a little kid goes to school every day and studies really hard and gets into Harvard, uh, does that mean if I go to school every day and study really hard, I'll get into Harvard? No, it doesn't. So th that's an indirect uh, variable. It's not a direct variable. Um, and so this thing, so blue eye color might actually be correlated with some other aspect that really is directly linked to your risk of macular degeneration. Maybe a, a higher frequency of having one of the AMD risk genes, for example. Almost certainly that's the case. Um, and and the problem is when you have a secondary variable, it's possible to make a bunch of associations, only some of which are legitimate. So the, the light exposure idea is a very old idea. It turns out, you know, that's been studied to death and there's just no evidence at all that it makes any difference. And the reason is um, there's plenty of light inside your eye. You know, maybe if you lived uh, in the dark all the time, that might be a legitimate test. And actually there are some diseases, believe it or not, where light exposure does accelerate disease progression but this isn't one of them. No, we spent a lot of time, our coordinators, you know, in our 4,000 patient, actually talked to these patients who were in their 60s and 70s, asking them when they were 18, where did, where did you live and where did you move? And we spent two hours looking at these questionnaires to see what the sunlight exposure was. It came up with a big fat zero. It made no difference, you know, what the exposure was. So, so it's absolutely true that the light exposure uh, is, not, is not one of the risk factors that we thought was originally important, but I think that's been debunked to a great, a great deal. Uh, but I don't want to forget to mention that light exposure is a risk factor for skin cancer. So don't, right. don't, don't lose track of that. So when, when people ask me actually about this light exposure thing, what I say is, you know, um, it's not going to save you from macular degeneration. But on the other hand, wearing a broad brimmed hat and not being out between 10 and 2 during the day is going to reduce your risk of skin cancer. And if you happen to live in certain places, like, for example, Australia, that's a really, really important, in fact, little kids in Australia have these, um, these hats that drape down over their neck because it's such an important problem with the increasing incidence of uh, melanoma, basically. So there are reasons to be concerned about sunlight exposure. Actually, you answered that question that came about sunlight damage and how it affects AMD. So thank you. Okay. <laughs> Um, is AMD inherited and is genetic testing needed? That's Dr. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, it, genes play a big role in macular generation. I, it's not your typical, you know, how you think it's, it's from one generation to another. It's so-called autosomal dominant. I have a gene like what we call juvenile macular generation, Stargardt's disease. It can be inherited. Uh, it can be inherited, but it's also uh, has an interplay between the, the, the environment. We talked about the diet and things. So it's not like a strict, you know, I'm going to get it because my mother had it. Uh, it's possible you'll get it. But 60% of the genetics do get passed on, but it can be modified by the smoking and by environment. So it's not so straightforward. So we know a lot about the genes. The genetics has been fascinating to all of us who are interested in macular generation. We hope to learn from the genetics how the disease develops and perhaps then learn how to treat it a little bit better. So for a research point of view, genetic testing is extremely important. We encourage that, you know, very much so because it was two very, very important uh, what we call phenotyping, looking at the disease itself, uh, all the different aspects of it, and then looking at the genes to see whether we can make some associations or correlations and looking at genetic pathways. And it took something like 35,000 patients, that we, which we did a study on. We found 52 areas in the genetics. That's really quite important. So it's, it's actually quite remarkable how much we know about genetics. But having said that, it doesn't help us predict what happens to patients. So for example, we did a study in which we put all the genes together and we looked at how it progresses. And then we also looked at what we call modeling. We, we model, we put all the factors together and see where things go. And genetics added a small amount. The most important part we found was actually having an eye exam. The fundus features, looking for those drusen and other changes was a highly predictable of whether you get macular generation or not, much more than genetics. Uh, so there have been thoughts that genetics might be important 
in terms of uh, interacting with the treatments that you get. People might be harmed by it or they might be beneficial by it. For example, we looked at diet and we found that people with the protective type of genes, uh, and if they ate Mediterranean diet, they had a, a better improvement. But are we gonna do genetic testing on that? No, because we're gonna recommend people have a good diet. It doesn't make any difference what your genes are. And so there has been some controversy. Uh, there are people who really believe genetic testing is important before you start the ARID supplement. And we were not able to prove that. Uh, and not only did we not able to prove that, we had other investigators look at it. So the genetic testing doesn't give you a handle on what's gonna happen in the future because people who have complement factor H, this important gene, never get the disease. Uh, and there are people who get the disease and don't have any of the genes. So it doesn't work so easily, it's not so clear. Uh, I know you get it with 23 and me and other things like that, but to specifically test for genetic testing for AMD is probably not warranted. Our organization is the American Academy of Ophthalmology, which is our sort of professional organization that gives us a lot of guidelines on how to treat patients, how to manage patients, have recommended that we don't do genetic testing. Not only have they done that, a number of other societies have said that. The cost is expensive. We don't know what to do with the data and it can cause sort of undue stress for people because you don't know if you can get the disease or not. Even if you have a gene, 30% of normal population can have it and not have the disease. So, so I think for those good reasons, we don't recommend genetic testing for patients. Genes are important and if it's for research, by all means do it and, and really understand that it can help in some ways, but we cannot really use it to manage the patient and in either for treatment or for predicting progression. Dr. Zarkin, did you wanna add anything to that? I, I agree obviously with Dr. Chu, who is an expert in this area, by the way, for all of you listening. Um, the one caveat I, I uh, would want to suggest to the audience is to sort of explain in a little bit more detail what Dr. Chu means by the term uh, research. One, one type of research where genetic testing uh, is not infrequently done uh, is in treatment trials because one of the possibilities is that um, as these newer treatments for macular degeneration undergo evaluation, it's theoretically possible that the treatment will work better in patients that have one set of genes versus another set of genes. And so it could evolve that eventually there is a, a treatment that really is uh, better only if you have a certain genetic profile. And if, that, if such a treatment ever is identified, then there would be a value in getting the genetic testing. But what's remarkable is that, that although people have looked really hard, all the anti-VEGF treatments work the same, no matter what your genetic background is. Uh, smoking is bad, no matter what your genetic background is, although your genetic background can make it worse, but it's no, not good even if you don't have any of the known risk genes. So uh, from a practical standpoint, it, it's really pretty hard to justify getting genetic testing from a treatment perspective today. And one thing I would caution you in, as a doctor, if you're not gonna do anything with the test result, don't get the test. It's a mistake to order a test that you're not gonna to use to make a treatment decision on. Very important idea. I second that, that's really important. You're wasting your money and your efforts. And creating hazard for yourself. Exactly, actually. all the stress that you get, what do I do with this information? So a uh, related question, if a parent has AMD, at about what age would you suggest young adults get an ophthalmologist exam rather than just an eye exam for correcting vision? There are different, uh, um, that's a tricky question. So let me start at the beginning. The American Academy of Ophthalmology recommends that you get an eye exam uh, as a child, number one. And if your eye exam is normal as a child, that you get an eye exam every two years once you reach the age of 44 or 45. And then it, you get an eye exam every year once you reach the age of 65. So that's bedrock. Then there are the, um, we get into the, the problem of semantics. Uh, what is macular degeneration? So for example, 
if a person has, if they're quite nearsighted, as a child, that nearsightedness might be identified. And for, and for young adults and children who are quite nearsighted, um, they can develop a form of macular degeneration called myopic macular degeneration. So for example, if there was a family history of high myopia, I would say that's one set of uh, issues of when are you gonna start getting your eye exam. Then if we go into what I think the nature of this particular question is, um, there are families, and I'm sure Dr. Chu takes care of some, I do too, where the onset of macular degeneration, or what we would probably call age-related macular degeneration, violates the rules. So we, we tend to say, unless you're over the age of 55, whatever you have, we're not gonna call age-related macular degeneration. But there are some families where they actually get an onset of disease earlier than that. Now, in some cases, we know what the problem is. For example, Soresby fundus dystrophy is a disease that can look quite a lot like age-related macular degeneration, but it's really not that. But the onset of that problem happens when the patients are in their 30s. They're gonna have a family history of that problem. If they have a family history of source B fundus dystrophy, then we're gonna evaluate their family members at a much earlier age than if they have typical age-related macular degeneration. If you're in one of those unusual families where you have what looks like age-related macular degeneration, but the onset was at age 45, probably we're gonna evaluate your family members at an earlier age than normal. I'm describing a vanishingly small number of patients right now. For the vast majority of people, for, the, for virtually everyone who's in this audience now, if not everyone, their family members should get an eye exam according to the interval that's recommended by the American Academy of Ophthalmology. Not really nothing special. And they shouldn't smoke. That would be the other thing I would advise them not to do. But I don't know if Dr. Chu agrees with that because she's actually the epidemiologist and I'm not. No, I agree with you totally on that. I, I think... Um... The eye exam is important, and what the academy has stressed is, I think, it's, that interval is very reasonable uh, to to maintain. And in fact, I don't think people actually go every two years as they should. Uh, and I think if the family history is there. You should be more vigilant and making sure you are being seen. Uh, as Mar Marco said, the the ARID supplement is given to people who already have macular degeneration. So often, the, you know, the question is always, my my parents have this terrible macular degeneration. Should I be, you know, taking it too? And my question, I answer always is, well, get an eye exam. That's more important. So they need to get an eye exam more regularly, especially by their time age 65. They should be having yearly. Uh, even if they're, you know, in their 50s, they probably should have an eye exam just to make sure they don't have macular degeneration. Then they can start on some of the ARID supplement. But otherwise, I, I think. Sticking to those uh, guidelines by American Academy, I think, is very reasonable to do. Great. Um, and this kind of goes back a little bit to what was discussed at the top of the hour. Um, are there any promising treatments for, um, from clinical trials for geographic atrophy? Yes. I mean, there are two. That I'm aware, the two that I think are the most promising both involve a class of drugs called complement inhibitors. Um, one is a, a company called Apellus that makes a C3 inhibitor, if you happen to be familiar with the complement pathway. The other one is a company called Iveric Bio, for which I'm a consultant, and they make a C5 inhibitor. Uh, the phase two trials uh, and the, the Iveric Bio phase two trial is really a very large trial and double mask. Um, the phase two trials showed remarkably similar results, about a 27% reduction in the rate of progression of geographic atrophy, which um, if you think about this as a doctor, um, once, the, once the patients lost their central vision, you know, I'm not sure how important these drugs are, but if a person's developing uh, areas of atrophy around the center of their vision, and that's typically how it starts, uh, then these drugs could be really important uh, because when you think about the average age of a person getting geographic atrophy, they're probably in their early 80s or late 70s. And if you can reduce the rate of spread uh, by a third or a quarter um, and therefore prolong their central vision by something like five or 10 years, uh, that may be their whole remaining lifespan. So it, it could, these, I think I'm very hopeful that something like this is going to end up working. Um, and and trust me, there are other treatments that are under development. Um, 
there's so much money to be made by developing a, an effective therapy for this condition uh, that there's a lot of risk capital available uh, to develop uh, and explore uh, potentially reasonable treatment alternatives for this. Um, but at the moment, no. The, at the moment, the, the thing to do is to just stick to your eye doctor. They'll know what's available. Um, don't, don't try to be your own doctor. I think at this point also it should remind people that they should go to a low vision specialist if they have central vision loss already. Besides your own doctor, I think that you know, where you're not completely blind, you have that peripheral vision that can still work and it's really important to get as much you can maximize your ability to use that peripheral retina that's still intact and, and to get the best devices. Right now, many people are very computer savvy. The devices are amazing. Uh, so there's a lot of things one can do to help maximize that low vision, uh, even though we don't have good treatment for geographic atrophy. And as Marco says, I think there's some promising things coming along the pipeline. We hope that will help us. In the meanwhile, be, be sure to use that, those, those low vision specialists. Thank you. That's a very important suggestion. The other thing uh, that I learned actually when I was at Wilmer was um, you don't need to be 2200. You don't need to be legally blind to benefit from a low vision specialist. In fact, the patients who they can help the most are people that have intermediate visual loss, you know, say in the range between 2050 and 2080. Um, plus there's one other aspect to low vision that goes beyond the devices and that's um, lifestyle adaptations. So uh, in, for example, where I work, our low vision specialist is a woman who happens to have been visually impaired her whole life. There are so many things that she can teach patients about how to navigate the activities of daily living despite the visual impairment that they have. Cooking, getting around the house, crossing a street. There's a lot of practical issues. And um, that has nothing to do with making you see, see better, uh, you know, but it, it does have a lot to do with making your life better. So uh, low vision specialists can really provide a lot of value even when you have severe or even intermediate uh, degrees of visual loss. Thank you. Um, another question, can secondhand smoke cause AMD? That's a good question. That's a very good question. Uh, we know that you know, smoking, it's smokers themselves will have an effect, but I don't think that's been carefully studied, uh, at least for macular generation. One would assume that you might take in some of that. Um, and obviously it's not good for it to be in a smoking environment. If you can avoid that, obviously it's good, but we don't have any you know, finite data suggesting that is important. But intuitively you think that's not good for your, your family. You've got kids coming in, others, people there, um, you know, and, and the older you have, there might be some other respiratory issues. So and it's important that, that the lifestyle is kept as clean as possible. And even with secondary smoke, if you can avoid it, but obviously we don't have good data on that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And um, what new symptoms should prompt a call to your eye doctor? If you have AMD. A change in your vision. So very often patients want to become very precise um, in defining what kind of a change in their vision should prompt the phone call. And that is the wrong question. Um, anything that you notice that's different potentially could be a problem. And it's possible that by talking to your doctor on the phone, you can work out, is it enough of a problem to come in or not? But in general, I would, I would downplay the value of that interaction uh, because the way, if you have the wet form of the disease, for example, the best time to treat the patient, uh, Dr. Chu actually mentioned this previously, the best time to treat the patient is when their vision is relatively good. So subtle changes in the vision um, can be a sign of enough disease activity to warrant injection therapy. And in fact, Dr. Chu was involved, I hope she'll talk to us about it, a study where this home monitoring device was used. Why don't you just tell us? Um, I, sure. I should shut up. Yeah. <laughs> no, no. So we had a study where we um, 
I had a clinical trial. We flipped the coin and one half of the group got this monitoring device. That was a home device that was sent in and they have to have a, a telephone line and we plugged it in and went into a central monitoring space. Uh, they checked their eyes. We recommended every day. Of course, that wasn't done every day, but at least two or three times a week they checked it. And they would, we would look for changes that are very subtle changes in their vision that they couldn't even actually spot out. Some of them I had no idea. Uh, by monitoring these very subtle symptoms or su subtle changes, we were able to bring the patients in with better visual acuity uh, who had the onset of new blood vessels in, the, in that eye. So the importance of picking up these changes is, is remarkable. So the, the monitoring, course does cost some money and there is a machine that's available for it. We and traditionally we've used this AMSR grid, which is that, you know, like a graph paper we look at. Uh, I often just tell patients, you know, cover one eye and read like you normally do, like a newspaper or looking at the straight line. If there are any changes, please you know give us a call. Uh, but clearly those patients who had the early monitoring and came in early they came in earlier, shorter duration, have smaller lesions, and they were had much better visual acuity by at least two lines than those who did not uh, have, the, have the monitoring. So monitoring may be very important. We, we, we believe it is important. It's still difficult to implement a, a good system where people can be monitored very carefully uh, for vision loss. And these are patients who don't have macular degeneration in, in one eye yet, the, 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 the severe form, but they have it in both eyes, the intermediate form. People who already have it in one eye, they're often being treated. I think they often have the butt fill eye be a little bit better off because they're being seen more frequently. So between the doctor and the patients, again, it's that emphasis of trying to get you in before your symptoms are worse and your vision is much worse than it should be. You know, the, for those of you, and probably this will be the majority, who, who don't have access to one of those devices, uh, and we're not advocating that you go out and buy one on your own, so please understand that. Uh, I think the simplest uh, way of translating what Dr. Chu said is to find something that you look at every day, every day, the same thing. Uh, and it, it'll probably ought to be something printed, and it probably ought to be under exactly the same lighting conditions. So typically the best place for that to be is on the mirror in your bathroom, because <laughs> you could look at that every morning when you're brushing your teeth one eye at a time. And if you notice something changing about the way things look, that's a phone call to your doctor. Uh, and, then, and then they'll listen and they'll guide you through what to do next. But that's what I mean by don't be your own doctor. When you notice a change, don't try to figure out what it means. Talk to the doctor taking care of you. Let them help you figure it out. Let them help you figure out if you need to come in for an evaluation or not. And you don't, you, of course, these devices have been proven to be better than what I've just told you to do. But if, unless you have one of them, the next best thing to do, I think, is something along the lines of what I'm suggesting. It's the same thing every day. It's the same lighting every day. It's the same time every day. So you become, once you start doing it, you become very sensitive to how it's supposed to look. And you become, therefore, very sensitive to when it doesn't really look the same anymore. And that's when, that's, that's your go signal. That's good advice, Marco. It's really good advice. Okay. Um, this is a question regarding um, a treatment, Elama Protide. I'm sure I am really uh, messing up the name. So E L A M I P R E T I D E. Um, I think this is um, a treatment from, it's a mitochondrial treatment out of um, stealth bio. Um, perhaps it's being used for ge geographic atrophy. Um, are either one of you familiar um, with this particular drug? And if I'm there not. are any relationship to AMD or um, wet or dry. Could you spell the name of the drug for me again, Amy? Sure. E L A M I P R E T I D. Is it made by Stealth? Is it Stealth Company? That's correct. It is. Yeah. So it's it's a mitochondrial um, drug that that um, Scott Cousins been working on, Marco. I think you might you know not, might know about that that study basically. Yes, I um, do. Yeah. 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 So well, that 
Yeah, go ahead, Amy. No, you go ahead. Go ahead, Mark. You go ahead. You go ahead. Well, yeah, I would just say um, the the rationale for it. So actually, it turns out I, I do know about it. The the rationale for it is very legitimate. Um, because in fact, there are, for example, known genetic abnormalities in the mitochondria uh, that increase your risk of developing age-related macular degeneration. Uh, the other reason it's legitimate is that unlike our normal DNA, our mitochondrial DNA does not have an endogenous repair mechanism. And the mitochondria are in an environment uh, which is enriched in reactive oxygen species. So the mitochondrial DNA is, um, is exactly what tends to get the most damaged as we get older. And there's going back into the 50s, a hypothesis uh, that uh, th these sorts of um, redox reactions are actually what account for biological aging in humans. So plenty, plenty of rationale for the drug. Um, and then of course, before you do a, what's called a phase three clinical trial, you do a lot of basic science experiments, animal experiments, and these are models of the human disease that you're trying to treat, but they're not the disease itself. And so there's been promising data from these early phase trials. And now this drug uh, is in a phase three clinical trial, I believe. Um, but let me tell you something. The overall probability of a successful phase three trial result is 16%. Okay, after all of the stuff I just told you. So that's why, that's why we have the phase three trials, because there's a difference between a good idea and the truth. And until you get the phase three trial data, you don't really know if something works or not. And in fact, even when it works in a phase three trial, you don't really know if it's gonna work in the real world because there are a lot of restrictions about the enrollment criteria, the treatment protocol, many, many artificial features of a phase three trial that, are, that can really cripple something when it gets out into the real world. And, so I could give you examples of each of these things. So summary is, if you're, if you're interested in it and you can enroll in the phase three trial, by all means, go for it. You'll, even if the trial doesn't work, you'll be contributing to, to knowledge, which is very important. But if you're not interested in being part of an experiment, that's what a phase three trial is. It's an ethical experiment, but it's an experiment. Uh, then you should just stick to your doctor and they'll update you when the phase three trial data are available. You'd probably be able to read about it in the New York Times if it works. Um, so I hope that answers your question. Thank you very much. Um, we have come to the top of the hour, um, and I don't see any more questions. Um, if, you, if you have a burning question and you are on the fence or you're trying to type, um, please go ahead and, and, and hit send so I can see that. Um, but at this time, I do want to thank our panelists, um, as well as everyone who have attended uh, today. So again, if your question, um, you didn't get a chance to answer it or, or you're pondering, we will take additional questions um, by email. You can email info at fightingblindness.org, and we will certainly get back to you um, addressing your question. Uh, Dr. Zarbin or Dr. Chu, do you have anything else before we close out? No, I don't I wanna, have anything else. No, go ahead. I no. want to thank all of you for supporting the Foundation Fighting Blindness. Uh, it's a terrific organization. Uh, one day I hope somebody does a, a documentary about it. Uh, with a remarkably small amount of capital, uh, they were one of the driving forces that led to the development of gene therapy for a childhood form of blindness. Uh, they're very committed to helping you. Uh, they have tremendous uh, scientists and doctors who uh, review the grant applications. Uh, they take their work very seriously. They're very eager to develop treatments. They're not just interested in counting the number of angels on the head of a pin. Um, so it's a, it's a uh, and finally, and most importantly, maybe, the of all the organizations that I know of that provide information to patients, the organizations in which I have the greatest confidence uh, are the National Eye Institute, which has a website, and the Foundation Fighting Blindness, which has a website. So if you, if you wanna, they don't just put stuff on their website, they vet it through their team of experts, scientists and doctors, to make sure that the information they're providing is accurate and, and, you know, and believable and so forth. So it's a, very, it's a very good way to stay in touch with uh, new developments in the field. Um, 
Anyway, I hope you found this session useful. Well, I want to thank, thank you for having me. And I'm very delighted to see that FFB actually now has more of an interest in back of generation itself. They've been a lot of inherited but older generations, and, which has been terrific. They, they've spearheaded many, many studies and really been a great, uh, a great collaborator uh, with a number of organizations and done some great work themselves. And we're really happy that, that we're able to contribute to this. And hopefully we will work in the future together on other things, especially in macro generation. So thank you for having me. Thank you, Amy, and thank you to the FFB. Great. Thank you Perfect. both. And this concludes our session. Thank you, Mark. Enjoy your weekend. Take care. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.